Please be seated. A grace to all those of you who are here with us in the church and a grace to all those of you joining us online and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so um, as our lesson from the Gospel of Mark, which I just read, suggested, the Bible is not so much a book about other people, it's a, it's a book about us. Um, and I want to say before I formally begin my sermon this morning uh, that I, I know that, I just want to acknowledge that we are all still processing the shock of the attempt on former President Trump's life yesterday evening. And my sermon this morning is about something different. I'm actually preaching on Ephesians, <laughs> not on Mark. Um, and I understand that parents in particular in the congregation or online may be at different places this morning and discussing what's happened with their kids, but I, I want to begin just by inviting all of us to pause for a moment and to pray for our country, for what has happened, for what continues to unfold, and for a renewed commitment to civility and reconciliation to take hold among us. Let us pray. Eternal God, in whose perfect kingdom no sword is drawn but the sword of righteousness, and no strength known but the strength of love, so mightily spread abroad your spirit that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace as children of one Father, to whom be dominion and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is a stressful moment, friends, okay? Uh, and I want for you to know that your church is here for you, and I am here for you. I... I encourage all of us to hold close all those who are dear to us, all those whom we love, and I really mean this part, especially those with whom we disagree politically. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. So this morning we are nearing the end of our summer sermon series on faith. We began a few weeks ago by clarifying that faith in the New Testament doesn't really mean to believe in a set of concepts. It means to trust God, to entrust God with your life and your livelihood, to put your life and your livelihood in God's hands, as it were, rather than in your own. Now, like all trust, this trust is earned over time, as it were, by God in the course of his relationship with us, and that makes it a gift of our relationship with God. It comes about kind of naturally from that relationship. When we lean into that trust, it can console us. And when we lean away from it, when we resist it, we discussed this last week in particular, God waits on us. Uh, God lets us and our world have our way. God allows us to resist entrusting Him with our lives and our livelihoods. But... Crucially, God is always working behind the scenes for our good, regardless of whether we ask him to or not, regardless of whether we have entrusted our lives to him or not. God is pressing the storm in our lives to calm. God is pressing the tumor in our bodies to shrink, and God is pressing us to accept whatever help it is we might need, waiting on us freely, to accept those gifts, to be sure, but still pressing all the same, always working for our good. And we ended last time by saying that to have faith is to try to trust, to strive to trust that God will get God's way, not so much because God is domineering, but because he is relentless. He will work endlessly to get what he wants. And eternity is an awfully long time in which to do so. And this morning, our lessons from Ephesians adds one more dimension to faith. 
we're at the very beginning of the letter to the Ephesians. We're going to be in it for a couple of weeks in the lectionary. And Paul begins the letter by using the language of destiny. Now, I think that when we hear the language of destiny, particularly Americans with our Puritan heritage, right, the pilgrims and so on, we can't help but hear it as predestination. That's what destiny must mean. We hear destiny and we think predetermination, actually, as in God controlling everything that happens and by controlling everything that happens, ensuring that everything will happen according to plan. I think that when many of us hear words like these from Ephesians, that's what we think about, God being in control of everything and pulling the strings. But as I suggested last week, I just don't think that's how God works. I don't think God is in control of everything or making everything to happen because God's power is not coercive. It is inviting, as I said. It waits on us. I think that instead, what Paul is saying in our passage from Ephesians is that God has a goal, and God can see the end game, and God has a plan to get there. And to get all of us there, come what may, come whatever roadblocks we or the world might throw up at God. So we are destined for adoption as God's children because God is going to work tirelessly and eternally until we freely accept his invitation to be adopted as his children. That's what it means, that this is our destiny. It is our job freely to choose what God has ensured will be our destiny in the end. Because he is relentless and he is infinitely ingenious and creative. Our destiny is assured not because God determines all of the events of our lives, but because God himself is determined. Determined to gather us all up in Christ. And to have faith, to set our hope on Christ, as Paul puts it, I think is to have the sense, to have a vision or a feeling that somehow God is for us, somehow God is for you, has your back, and that God has and will somehow take care of everything in the long run. That is the hope that I think we've all come to church this morning hoping to rekindle inside of us. At least, that's why I have, why I continue to give my life to the church. Somehow in the fullness of time, God will take care of all this. And Paul says that when we hear that word of truth, the good news of our salvation, and we believe in God's ability to bring it to pass, we trust him to do so. Paul says we are marked with the Holy Spirit. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's how the passage from Ephesians ends. Being sealed by the Holy Spirit is permanent. It is indelible. The gospel, once discovered, touches our hearts forever. And it keeps popping back up in our lives, I think, in ways we least expect. Regardless of whether we say we believe in God, regardless of whether we call ourselves Christians, regardless of how often we do or don't come to church, the Spirit has stamped it inside of us. So I want to share a story with you. It's not my story, uh, but it's a story told to me and to many others by the priest who taught me to be a priest, Ann Richards. She was an associate rector at the parish in New Canaan that I came to you from. She was a former canon of the Diocese of New York, a chaplain at the Grace Church School in Manhattan. Ann died, as so many of you know, Ann died in 2018, but when she was a young woman training for ministry, she was working at NYU Medical Center in the city. And it was the early 1980s. It was the era of the AIDS pandemic. 
and floor after floor of the hospital was filled with young people dying of AIDS. And one day, a nurse paged Anne, who was a chaplain at NYU at the time, and said that a young man wanted to see somebody. His name was Michael. And so Anne goes up to his room, she says, and he's sitting up in the bed. And he greeted her by saying, I think it's time I get my life together. Now, Michael had a story that was typical of his time. He had been brought up in Florida in a devout, fundamentalist Christian family. He'd gone to church all throughout his childhood. He knew, like so many of us who grow up in traditions like that, when he knew his Bible backwards and forwards. But when he was 18, he told his parents that he was gay. And his parents loved him very much. Given their background, this wasn't good news for them. And when she told this story, she always made sure to say, these people were not monsters. They were trying very hard to love their son in the way that they knew how, as best as they knew how. But they made a horrible mistake. They wanted Michael to change, and he tried some early forms of what's now known as conversion therapy, but he couldn't change, and he didn't change. And when he told this to his parents, they said that he couldn't be a part of their family anymore. Now, Michael had just graduated from high school, and he packed his bags, and he took a bus to New York, and there he made a really good life for himself. He really did. He had a good group of friends. He had a good job. But then, like every young person in the world, he did some reckless stuff. And some of our recklessness lands us in a little bit of trouble, and some of our recklessness lands us in a lot of bit of trouble. His, unfortunately, was the latter sort, and he ended up infected with HIV. And so the day that he had asked to see a chaplain, the day that Anne met him, a doctor had told him he was going to die. He. Anne got to know Michael over the next four weeks. She got to spend basically a month with him in the hospital. He hadn't seen his family in six years. And about a week before he died, Michael said, I think I better call my mom. And his mom flew up and moved into his hospital room and took care of him. And talked about the way that she would lift up his straw, said he could take a sip. She said she'd never seen anything so tender in her life. A few days after his mom arrived, Michael said, I think I better call my dad. And his dad, who had never been on a plane before, his dad, who was terrified of flying, went to his doctor, and his doctor tanked him up with Valium. And he managed to get on the plane to New York, and he made it to see his son. He brought the rest of Michael's siblings with him. And when they arrived, Michael took Anne's hand and held it out to his father. And he said, Ann, I would like for you to meet my dad. He has been the best dad a boy could ever have. And his dad came over to the bed and he said to his son, we love you, Mikey. We have always loved you. We just couldn't say it for a long time. And he wept, and Anne said that he kissed his son on the forehead. Michael then asked to see each member of his family alone, one by one. This took two hours, because as they came into the room, Michael would talk with each of them about how much he loved them and about his memories of them. And when he was finished, when Michael was done, he told Anne that he wanted everybody to come back into the room and he wanted for them to say the Lord's Prayer together. And he led them in the Lord's Prayer. And a few minutes later, he died. And he was 26 years old. It was miraculous. It completely changed Anne's life. 
who changed mine when she preached it at my ordination to the diaconate ten years ago last month. What happened to Michael was that as a boy, he received the word of truth, the gospel of his salvation against all odds, in spite of the prejudice of the childhood culture he grew up in, in spite of being rejected by his family, in spite of the fact he died an untimely death, somehow God got across to him that he was loved and taken care of and okay. And that faith that he was loved and taken care of by Jesus, it shined through the ugliness and the pain of his life. So that at the end, as Anne always said when she told this story, Michael became Jesus for his family. That's what happened. Michael became Jesus for his family. Michael healed his family. He was God's grace and God's forgiveness for his mom and his dad and his sisters and his brother. Because the Holy Spirit, which is bigger than any church, the one he grew up in, but also this one, the Holy Spirit, which is bigger than any church, bigger than any culture, any tradition, had stamped true faith indelibly on Michael's heart. And that same faith, friends, is what the Holy Spirit is at work even this morning to bring about in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.